Stay strong. Stand tall. An animated podcast by Young Mob in Victoria. We interviewed people we respect about how they got through hard times. A podcast by young people. For young people. Stay Stay strong. strong. Stay strong. Hi, my name is Sabrina. I'm a sister girl from Melbourne, Victoria. I'm 17 years old. Today, I'm interviewing Emma Bastable. She's a sister girl, solicitor, community netball player, and a DJ. She shares her experiences as a DJ and trans First Nations person. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Emma Bastable. I'm a 29-year-old Gamilaroi woman um, living in Gadigal country in Sydney. Yeah, my mob is from far north New South Wales, but over a bit, so um, Tari sort of area. I'm a sister girl and I'm a solicitor. Um, That's my sort of day job, I guess. So I work at a place called the Public Interest Advocacy Centre. I work in sort of Aboriginal justice and policing and also do some work around um, child protection and and raising the age of criminal responsibility. Yeah, it's a mix of different things. I play a lot of netball, um, quite involved in community sport. I play for like seven or eight teams, which is crazy, but yeah, that's a really big part of my life as well. And yeah, I also DJ, which I think is how you maybe heard of me. How did you start out as a DJ? I'm, I'm a big regular in the dance and electronic scene in, in Sydney. Yeah, I just used to go to heaps and heaps of events started going to the clear scene and then eventually got more into sort of the dance and electronic music scene and made friends with heaps of the DJs, heaps of the promoters. It got to a point where I sort of was like, oh yeah, like I could do this, like I could DJ, it looks really fun. And I'm, I've never been musical, like I come from a musical family, but music has always been like a really huge part of my life. But yeah, I've, I've always loved dancing. I think dancing is just like such a, such a great way to connect with your body, especially, you know, as a transgender person. And I think it's just a really good way of getting in touch with yourself. You know, I love dancing. I love music. Um, it just seemed like something that was worth having a go at. Yeah, I, I really love art. It's my passion. And my mum and dad inspired me to do my art. And yeah. because of their love and that, I've actually become a great artist nowadays. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. Quick question. Do you like art, like paintings and that? I always enjoy it when I get a chance to do it. My, my grandmother actually was an artist. She's quite a well-known Aboriginal artist. Her name was Elaine Russell. Um, she, she passed away a few years ago. Um, but she was definitely, out of the Aboriginal side of my family, the one who I guess I had the most to do with. And I wish I had spent more time with her before she passed away. But, like, I have her books and stuff. Um, she's written in a number of um, children's books, like picture books, that talk about, like, her experience on, like, missions and stuff. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not super close with my dad's side of the family, and, which is my Aboriginal side. So that, that was something that I struggled with, I guess, growing up. But I have since sort of come, come to terms with by meeting other people, you know, younger people, I guess, who are, who are in similar situations. What was it like when you started, basically? Yeah, so I started just sort of recording mixes just for myself, just to sort of document my progress. And... I was posting them sort of monthly for a bit online um, and then people seemed to like them. And yeah, it was kind of just a nice way of like communicating with people, I guess, um, during during the first lockdown in Sydney. But yeah, it was, it was weird because that I did this whole program with FBI Radio and the whole point was that we were going to do like all these events at the end of it. And we only got to do one out of the three. And then we all went into lockdown. And then so I was just recording mixes for about nine months after that. And then, yeah, started to play events at the start of this year. It was pretty much a full year of just practicing and learning at home and stuff and then eventually got to play events but it was it was a weird experience i guess because of covid what's it like being a role model yourself i guess it's always weird to think of yourself as a role model but i i am aware that um i guess i have a lot of visibility like um i work in the legal sector which is pretty underrepresented in terms of aboriginal people and trans people and and women and stuff so i i guess i just want to be authentic and, and true to myself um, and kind of, you know, put something out there. And as long as I'm sort of having fun and enjoying it, like, I don't really worry too much about what other people think. But I guess it, it's, it probably hasn't fully dawned on me that I could be a role model to people, but I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm diverse, I guess. So, you know, I'm, I'm something that people don't see very often. So I get that that can be 
you know, like an eye-opening experience, I guess, for some people. Uh, what are the biggest struggles you've had to face throughout your life? I guess, in a, in a lot of ways, I, I feel very privileged. Like, yeah, I've had a really good education and, you know, I've never really had to struggle in terms of, like, well, my mum putting food on the table and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like in a lot of ways I'm really lucky, but, yeah, I guess in high school I was sort of the only Aboriginal kid in the school, you know, and then transitioning in uni was hard as well. For me, it was um, it was something that uh, was really difficult to, like, transition at the same time as studying because studying is already, I found it really stressful. So I think that period in uni when I was sort of transitioning and, and studying at the same time, it just really amplified the anxiety of, but yeah, ever since I've gotten out of uni and started working, um, yeah, I feel feel like my life's, it's not like I'm never sad or I don't have issues, but yeah, I feel like overall I'm doing pretty well. I'm pretty lucky. How have you gotten through hard times, like hard times like that and lockdown? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, so I guess music, just listening to music and, you know, finding like TV shows and stuff that I like have been helpful for me. Um, I think something that I discovered when I was in my about mid-20s I guess was netball and I found that really helpful in terms of um finding like a community and being able to feel yeah just to be connected to my body and yeah to get out and about and it's a good way of like sort of meeting people and getting in a bit of you know social interaction without too much stress because you kind of just out of play netball but yeah you also kind of um get to meet people and be part of a team I guess as well so yeah I think community sport has been really big for me. Um, but yeah, obviously during lockdown, it's been a bit of a struggle, but I have a really good support network as well. And I think that that's probably the other thing that really helps me get through, Yeah, having having good people around me to, to love and support me. Have you ever experienced any hate as a DJ or any transphobic people or something? Not really. I, I guess I've been lucky in that, you know, it's hard to know what people say behind your back or anything, but For me, I think um, being trans or being Aboriginal has always been something that people see as like a really positive thing and something that they want to celebrate rather than something that... Want to celebrate it rather than hate it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's your advice for young mob who may be struggling? Yeah, it's it's a really good question. Um, I think finding community is, is so important and that really helped me. I went to a lot of schools where there weren't many Aboriginal people there wasn't really until uni that I started to sort of meet more people, um, more Aboriginal people. So I think, yeah, um, however you do it, whether it's going to like NAIDOC week events or find, finding finding Aboriginal sort of events that, that, um, that you feel comfortable to go to or, or joining, you know, joining like a team or if there's like an Aboriginal sport team or something that you can find. I, I think just, just meeting other Aboriginal people is probably the thing that's helped me the most because, yeah, I think I used to struggle with, feeling like I was always the only Aboriginal person. And I felt like I got asked a lot of questions about, I got put under a lot of pressure to like give speeches at assemblies and stuff in in high school. And I just didn't really feel comfortable doing it. So yeah, I think just finding a community um, in, in whatever way you can would be my advice. And how do you stand tall and stay strong during everything? I've been through a lot in terms of transitioning and getting through high school and stuff. It was really hard at, at times, like, you just get put under so much pressure. So I think by the time I was 18 or 19, I'd, I'd already been through a lot in terms of school, just just all the academic pressure. And then I transitioned in uni. And yeah, I think getting through uni was the hardest thing I've ever done. But it, I think it also gave me a lot of ability to withstand, I guess, adversity. But yeah, I've been lucky. Like all my workplaces and stuff have always been accepted and really supported. I've always worked for organizations where there's been like a lot of women, like in senior roles. And I think that's really helped. They they, they really want to support you and they want to see young, you know, Aboriginal women um, really succeed in in law. Just just being through a lot, but then also being really supported by co-workers and friends and stuff. And having, I guess, allies have been a really big help for me. Like feeling like I've got someone who's got my back if, you know, if something went wrong. What was your transition like as a sister girl? It it wasn't easy. I, I didn't I didn't know what being trans meant um growing up. Like I I didn't really see it on TV and it just wasn't something that really was talked about. 
it reached a point where I was very low, very, very low. And yeah, it wasn't until I sort of hit that really low point that I sort of realized that I had to do something about it. And I sort of just had like a, I guess like a light bulb moment. I was watching a YouTuber, a trans woman, and it, it was the first time I'd ever seen just a trans person just living their life, like just being who they were and not being like objectified or, you know, not being like on TV where often they're portrayed in really stereotypical ways and in really negative ways. So I think representation was so lacking for me growing up. So yeah, I felt like I kind of had to do it on my own. Um, like I didn't really have anyone to look up to when I was doing it. So yeah, it wasn't easy, but I did it at uni and I already had people at uni who were like at a staff level who really supported me and really wanted to see me succeed. Um, so I sort of told them um, pretty early on. They helped me in terms of um, like emailing my lecturers, like before, before I changed my name. They, they were like, oh, you know, just call this person, you know, Emma. And yeah, it, it was hard. Um, I, I would say the first year, you go through a lot of bodily changes and, um, you know, I, I felt very uncomfortable, I guess, in, in my skin for a long time. And then, yeah, eventually I, I started to socially transition and came out at uni and stuff. And it was kind of good doing it at uni in some ways because the law classes that I were in, like there were so many people that I didn't feel like anyone was really paying attention to me. Like there were so many other kids there or young people. And the other thing I just guess I had was like a really supportive um, uh, queer society at uni. There was two queer officers at uni. Um, and the year I transitioned, both of the queer officers were trans. Yeah, I guess I felt like if, if I was ever harassed or like, you know, told to not go into a bathroom or called by a wrong name by a lecturer, that I'd have um, people who would have my back, I guess. So I think that really helped. But yeah, it definitely took me a long time to feel confident, I guess. Yeah, I think it's it, it's always going to be a really big change and a difficult thing. But I felt like just having having support and having people who I knew would stand up for me really helped. What are some tips they have for another sister girl? There's plenty of us out there. That's one thing I've sort of learned through sort of being quite public, I guess, about, about being trans. Like I've done, I've done quite a few panels and stuff like for ACON, which is the, uh, which is like a queer organization in New South Wales that runs like health services. One thing that I got to do this year, which was pretty life-changing, I think, was that I, I marched with the First Nations float at Mardi Gras. I would really, really highly recommend that. I, I know normally it's open to people across the country, ACON run it. That was another way, I guess, of meeting more trans, like, you know, sister girls and brother boys and, and that sort of thing. It's a really amazing experience. So yeah, I guess just meeting, meeting other sister girls has been so great. And yeah, I guess just thinking about how um, transphobia and stuff, I guess it's a Western thing, like sister girls and brother boys have existed, you know, in Aboriginal culture for, you know, for millennia. From what I've heard, Aboriginal culture, our culture is the longest living one on the earth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think just doing research and realizing that it was this thing that already existed in, in, our, in our culture made me really proud, I guess, to, to be a part of that and to sort of rethink, I guess, some of the ways that people put us down, I guess, as being something that's come from colonization and it's come from sort of Western culture. We've had queer Aboriginals for years and we've had it in our culture for years and mainly transphobic stuff and homophobic stuff comes from um, Catholics, Bibles and all that comes from those types of religions. Yeah. Do you feel like a role model for the trans and sister girl and brother boy community? I don't know how I feel, I guess. Um, I feel like all I can really speak to is my own experience. And if other people, if it resonates with other people, then that's great. And I've done some, some panels around things like trans euphoria, which is not really talked about, you know, how trans experiences are often framed in terms of dysphoria and like through a negative lens, I guess. Yeah, I have been told by people that them seeing me just doing my thing, just existing um, in public, have kind of inspired them to, you know, pursue transition or feel more confident about it. It's always great to hear that sort of stuff. If I feel like I have something to say, I, I say it and I know that it, I can only speak for myself. Yeah, I try, I do, I do enjoy being in spaces where I can talk about that stuff, as long as it's sort of a safe place to do it. Any last words of wisdom for Aboriginal young people or any type of young people? I feel super lucky that I've always been able to do stuff 
that I feel passionate about. So I guess, yeah, maybe just find something that you're passionate about. And if you can do it for a living, that that's incredible. Like that that's what keeps me going. Like I work in law and obviously there's so much work to do around, you know, overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the criminal justice system. I guess I've been working in legal issues that affect Aboriginal people for most of my working life. Yeah, in various different roles. I've always felt really, really lucky to be able to work in that space because I feel like I, I'm privileged to have had a really good education and to have all these skills. And I feel like what, what would be the point of it all if I couldn't do something to, you know, help my community and sort of give back, I guess. So yeah, if you can find something that you're passionate about that you can also make a living doing, um, I think that is kind of the dream and that, that is, that's what keeps me driven. Thank you, Emma, for being a guest and thank you for accepting to allow me to interview you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. And um, it's always so nice to to be reached out to. And I guess you never really know what impact you're having as a person. Um, so it's always nice to be seen and to feel like I'm someone that people look up to. So thank you for, for reaching out. Yeah, it really means a lot. Hey, yo,